Thanks, Marcy. Great to see everyone today. Thank you to Marcy and Nikki and the Community Foundation for having us all. It seems like housing is at the top of everyone's minds and lists of concerns these days. Certainly, there it's very um, present for all of us on this call every minute, every day. So we're glad to be able to join you and share some of our perspective and hopefully some ideas and solutions as well. So I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves. First of all, as Marcy said, I'm Kaya Peterson. I'm the executive director of NeighborWorks Montana. We are a statewide organization that does lending and education and counseling, a number of other things. And we work really closely with uh, many of the housing organizations across the state. I am based in Missoula. So this place is really important to me um, as well as the work we do statewide. So let's go around the around the circle here. Let's start with Cindy, and then we'll um, go to Andrea and Ermina. If you can each just introduce yourselves and your organizations, and then we'll get into the meat of these really great questions and discussion today. Go ahead, Cindy. Hi, everyone. I'm Cindy Weiss, the Executive Director of the YBCA Missoula. Uh, the YBCA uh, provides uh, emergency housing for homeless uh, one and two parent uh, families. Uh, we also operate a secure, confidential uh, domestic violence shelter for those fleeing uh, domestic violence situations. Um, we also have a youth services program uh, working with children who have witnessed domestic violence or who um, are experiencing homelessness uh, and staying with us at our new uh, building called the Metal Ark. Great, Andrea. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, congratulations, Missoula Gives, on the $600,000 goal, or at least level. We're going to keep going, I think. Uh, my name is Andrea Davis. I'm the executive director of Homeward. Homeward is based in Missoula. We do work around the state. So we build homes that Montanans can afford around the state of Montana. And then in Missoula, we are a housing counseling agency. So we provide first time home buyer education and one-on-one -on -one pre purchase counseling. We provide renter education. We provide financial skill building and uh, education as well, one-on-one -on -one coaching. And um, hopefully we uh, don't necessarily need to help people post-purchase, but we always are there to offer if folks are having difficulty paying their mortgage. We can also help folks f find some solutions and keep people in their home. Thanks, Andrea. Ermina? Hello, thanks for having me. I'm Ermina Harold. I'm the director of Trust Montana. Uh, we are a statewide community land trust, um, and we work to preserve the affordability of homes, farms, and other um, important community land-based assets around the state. Um, and currently we're working in Belgrade, Livingston, um, Red Lodge, Missoula, Bozeman, um, and Helena. So. We're relatively new and uh, uh, we're kind of expanding across the state and I'm in Missoula, so. Great. So we're gonna dive right in to the meat of the topic with a very hard question, which is, what is the most pressing problem we are currently facing in regards to housing? Hard to pick just one, but I know you all have some great insights and perspective on this. So, Cindy, would you be willing to kick us off on yeah. this one? Sure. So, the YBCA works with um, folks who have very, very limited resources. Um, most of the families and individuals that we see um, are trying to get rental housing. And um, so, it especially in the last 18 months, it has just become such a struggle for those people who maybe have poor credit histories, past evictions, and to try to compete in this market, and then to find housing that is affordable in the long run for them. Uh, we, uh, through uh, federal HUD funding, are able to provide uh, rent assistance. We can pay double and even triple deposits uh, for families, we can pay up to 24 months of rent assistance, and yet um, we still are struggling to find uh, units and landlords that are willing to rent to our families. So that's really foremost in our minds right now, is affordable 
rental housing for um, very low income uh, people. Yeah, and as you said, feeling the effects of that even more in the current environment, which yes. is a, a, its own set of challenges. Armina, how about you? How would you answer that question? Um, I would say right now it feels like the most urgent and um, the biggest issue is the the market um, being kind of inundated with people from all over the country and maybe all over the world. I'm not sure. Um, purchasing purchasing a lot of our properties in Montana um, at prices that nobody that works in Montana mm -hmm. could afford. Um, and so it's just really hard to compete. It's really hard to get um, to get somewhere from a rental from a renter to a, a home buyer right now in Montana. Um, and we're just seeing a lot of people be displaced even in uh, even if you're not someone who's trying to move into the home ownership world and your renter, your property sells um, and it sells uh, for whatever the market can bear and then that new owner increases the rent. Um, and it's just happening you know, anecdotally all the time. And I'm not sure what data we have to show that yet, but it's it's looking pretty pretty bad for a lot of people. Yeah, we hear a lot from our lending partners and from our realtor partners. And um, I heard of some research recently looking at US Postal Service change of address forms, really trying to figure out what is that data. But as we all know, the data often lags what we see on the ground, right? It's a, it's a really complex set of data to try to understand and track. And while we're trying to really, you know, ground truth and make sure we know what um, what's really happening, we also are responding to what we see every day happening on the ground. So important, you know, we're, we're all trying to approach it from both of those angles and certainly seeing the impacts overall. Andrea, how about you? Most pressing housing problem. Yeah, I, I appreciate that you recognize that there's, uh, there's, this is real estate is such a complex issue. It's really, there's tendrils in almost every aspect of our economy and our society. But simply said, there are not enough homes that local workers and families can afford, both rentals and um, for purchase for home ownership. Our communities truly are stronger when everyone can afford a safe and healthy home. Our children have good places to grow up. Our veterans can return home. Our seniors can live here with dignity. And our workers, our workforce, they're able to be part of a thriving community and, and, um, and really be their best. So when that is threatened by rising rental and home prices, we have to work together to create solutions. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about workforce and economic impacts a little later in our conversation. But let's first, I mean, I'm going to have you start on this question, this next question, which is, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do to respond to this issue? That is such a hard question, actually. It was, I saw it in the email and I was, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have a really hard time with that one. Um, I feel like right now, because I'm trying to focus on, you know, the urgency of this situation that we're in in Montana, um, my first instinct is to just buy up as much property as possible um, and turn it into a perm permanently affordable home ownership opportunities for Montanans. Um, right now, we don't have a lot of like flexible funding that we can pounce on properties with. Um, so as a nonprofit, it's really hard to compete with all the other investors that are coming in and purchasing um, rentals and home ownership units. And um, so having all the money in the world would really help us pounce on um, projects and transition them into permanently affordable homes for people who otherwise are pretty much locked out of the home ownership market in Montana. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about this in the housing world just what does local control of real estate and property mean for a community, whether it's homeowners who are staying in place or renters who have a stable, stable rental and a landlord who um, lives in the community and may have a different perspective on what they're trying to do with that property than someone from another community. Um, and I think that's just such a great tie in to Missoula Gives and the concept of giving local and having our economy have these really strong local partners and folks who have control over um, the places where they live. 
So it's a great, great concept and certainly something if we had all the money to buy up all the land, <laughs> it would look very different than it is right now, wouldn't it? Um, Andrea, I'm gonna go to you next and we'll end this in you on this one. Go ahead, Andrea. Okay, all right, great. If I had all the money in the world, um, you know, I would do primarily three things. Build more homes that Montanans can afford uh, in Missoula and across the state. Um, two, we would continue to keep our financial skill building class and coaching free and available to all Montanans, you know, as they navigate their complex financial worlds. Um, and three, we would continue to keep our budget friendly, get ready for home ownership class and program available to Missoulians to help them make wise financial decisions for themselves and their families. And this is something right now, I think a lot of people are looking at the market and saying, how on earth would I ever you know, be able to afford a home? And the idea of taking our home buyer education class and then pre-purchase counseling is that we can uh, help identify ways in which people can really pay down debt and save a significant down payment, which ultimately will be more and more important. Um, the the more real estate, um, uh, you know, continues to rise. Hermina makes a, a really good point, and and Kaya, as did you. If we had all the money in the world and we had flexible funding, we would be able to react very quickly to opportunities that come on the market. Ultimately, organizations like ours are, you know, even if we're lucky enough to have some of our own capital to then leverage into bank financing, we're still working in a, in a financial environment that takes time. And uh, the market is so hot right now that we're operating with people that are paying in cash in a lot of situations. And ultimately that makes them much more competitive, um, even when you're thinking about whether that's a single family home or whether you're thinking about a small rental project that you'd like to be able to keep and maintain as affordable or a large rental project for that matter. So, you know, having flexible funding would be uh, very critical and, and to land bank. And that's a very good point. And be able to, if we see a piece of property that comes on the market to be able to grab it and hold it um, for eventual home development, whether that be rental or for sale. Yeah, you brought up a lot of really good examples of the things that we know are working and how do we have the opportunity to do much, much more of what we already know is working. Cindy, what would you do with all the money in the world? Well, I think all of those uh, things are important. Um, and uh, for us, especially more permanently affordable uh, rental housing uh, is important. Um, I think also with all the money in the world, I would hope that we would be able to address um, livable wages uh, in the community as well so that uh, people have the income uh, to uh, afford their own homes. Um, I also think that supporting uh, landlords uh, with mitigation funds and uh, you know, resources so that they are willing to take a risk with uh, the people that we're working with. Um, and um, I also think um, trying to do what we can to preserve the housing that's out there that is available uh, and to low-income people uh, to rent. Um, and that includes perhaps some of the remaining mobile home parks in the community. So, um, yeah, I think uh, those things would help. And like uh, Andrea said, it's really, what can we do to fund the efforts that are happening now and also uh, look at a strategy going forward um, for you know long-term success? Yeah, one of the things I love about listening to all of your answers is it it really highlights what how Marcy framed this conversation initially, which is there are all of these different things that need to be happening simultaneously to really make an impact and to really meet the needs of all Missoulians. Um, the variety of housing types from manufactured homes to apartments to home um, stick belt, you know, single family residences um, and the very different types of interventions you all talked about from land banking to education and counseling 
um, to building new properties, to preserving existing properties. And I think um, all of those things are happening in our community and in really important ways. Um, and again, just being able to do more of that would be really impactful. All right, Andrea, let's start with you on this next one. How does this issue impact the local economy and workforce? Thanks, Kaya. Well, you know, like I was saying at the beginning, our community is stronger when everyone can afford a safe and healthy home and a safe and healthy home that is, you know, in a reasonable location to their job. Uh, the current rental and real estate markets uh, in Missoula and really around the state um, you know, are certainly coupled with other challenges brought on by the pandemic. And it's just really making it very difficult for local workers and families to cover the basics. For existing employers, when there aren't homes that workers can afford, jobs go unfilled. Uh, you know, and the pressure of a high cost real estate market means that more workers live further from their job, which has implications um, to businesses and the local economy. For businesses that want to expand or move to Montana and to Missoula, they evaluate the real estate costs here and um, the availability for their workforce, knowing that home affordability um, for any income range is an element of quality of life. And um, it certainly has impacted some businesses from uh, establishing here and expanding here. We heard quite a bit of that this winter uh, during the uh, University of Montana's Bureau of Business and Economic Research Economic Outlook Seminar. They hold an economic seminar. Typically they cruise around the state, but they held it um, virtually this year. And almost every sector, every employer representing every sector in our um, economy in the in in the state identified a lack of homes that workers can afford, and they identified that as a stifling effect on economic um, comeback, economic stability, and economic growth. Um, when when workers can afford their home, not only can they afford the necessities of life, but then they have money in their pocket to be able to spend at local businesses. So you know, ultimately affordable homes is a foundational element to a strong economy and truly um, a very important economic infrastructure element um, to local economy, local and, and state economies. Yeah, absolutely. Cindy, how about you? How would you, what are you seeing in terms of the relationship between economy and workforce and housing? Well, I think uh, the same things that Andrea just talked about you know, uh, as a um, major of a nonprofit with 60 plus employees um, that has to provide 24-7 uh, coverage for our services, we are really struggling uh, to hire employees right now to be able to uh, sustain the wages that we would need to pay for them to be able to afford to live here and, and work. Um, and I think that, so, for us, um, it's going to impact our ability to continue providing the same level of social services in this community um, that is needed. And that, as Andrea said, across sectors, we're going to see businesses really facing the possibility of having to reduce what they can offer to the community because of that. Um, and then, you know, our staff are professional employees, um, but they are, just struggling, you know, the, the stress of uh, not knowing um, if they would be able to stay in the community, um, of just having to work paycheck to paycheck, um, even though they, you know, have uh, college degrees. It's, it's just um, kind of heartbreaking to watch that. Um, and so I think that it, it's going to impact the economy, it's going to impact um, children and homes uh, that are living uh, with housing instability um, it will have a long-term impact on them. Um, I worry about if we do have a significant economic downturn, um, what will happen uh, to folks who are purchasing homes at such a high level right now? Um, will we see a situation where we have foreclosures again? Um, it just seems like a very precarious time now. 
Yeah, thanks, Cindy. We've at NeighborWorks Montana and Homeward has been part of this too. We were very involved in the 2008 response after the, the crash and the housing crisis at that time. And we've been keeping a really close eye on what's happening with um, mortgage non-payment. And so far we're not seeing a lot of impact, but we are all holding our breath a bit to see what happens as, um, you know, the existing regulations begin to be lifted around um, mortgage mitigation. And um, even, you know, NeighborWorks Montana is a lender and in our current loan portfolio, we're not seeing a lot of um, negative impacts. But I think you're right with those longer term economic changes um, with how high prices are now, what might come down the pike and how do we make sure that we're, um, you know, we think a lot about this as an organization that focuses a lot on home ownership. How do we make sure that people are getting into sustainable home ownership? Something that exactly. if there is a change in income or if there is a significant um, change in the underlying economic conditions that they can, but that's not going to um, put them in a position where they're going to lose their homes. So I think mm -hmm. um, important. Yeah, great that we're all focusing both on what the, you know, getting people into the best opportunity they have available right now, but also knowing that it's not always going to look the way it looks today. Um, and right. sometimes it's hard to remember that when we're in the heat of the moment. So appreciate that. Ermina, what are you seeing in the, the links between housing and economic development and workforce? Um, I think Andrea and Cindy both did an amazing job answering that. So I would just echo what they said, first of all. And then again, anecdotally, um, just kind of what we're experiencing at Trust Montana with the calls we're getting from different communities around the state. Um, for a few years now, we've gotten calls from places like West Yellowstone and Red Lodge, and we've seen it happening in Whitefish where they really can't find workers, worker housing um, in their communities. And so they have a really big problem keeping people in the community and, um, ha and people have to drive on unsafe roads to get to their jobs. Um, and now we're seeing it, I feel like we're seeing it in Missoula um, more than we did before. And we're actually seeing the businesses um, uh, kind of complain that they can't find anybody to work their maybe $11 an hour job. Um, and, you know, I've been here for 15 or so years and I don't think I've ever seen that happen in Missoula. Um, and so it's just interesting to see what it, it was in the resort communities mostly um, and now it's really bad in the resort communities, but it's also now bad in Missoula. Um, and what we're seeing in like in places like West Yellowstone is that now they're losing teachers because teachers are cashing out um, on their homes and selling them for, to the highest bidder and moving out of town. And then if they hire a new teacher, they can't afford any homes in the community. Um, and it's it's put a fire under people's but I guess you could say in that community and in other communities, um, but it feels a little too late because it's really hard to intervene when home prices are already so high. Um, so it's tough to help at this juncture <laughs> in a lot of those situations. Um, and then in Whitefish and Bozeman, um, they had some policies in place to try to help the, the bad situation that they're dealing with, with affordable housing, and they were inclusionary zoning policies that we're going to, that we're starting to increase the number of affordable homes. And the legislature just passed a bill to um, outlaw inclusionary zoning. So I feel, I really feel for those communities because they've been working for years on those policies to make them work in their communities. Um, and now they can't use those policies. So um, yeah, I, that's all I would add to the great things that Andrea and Cindy said. Yeah, and what was so interesting about Whitefish and where those policies came from, it was really a very expansive and diverse working group who looked at housing issues in their community. And my understanding is the Whitefish Chamber of Commerce was one of the lead entities that helped to implement inclusionary zoning in that community. And I think that's a, it's, that's a really interesting trend, as you mentioned, Armina, that we're seeing statewide, that as housing becomes a barrier to people being able to move here or accept jobs here or stay here. Um, the, um, the, the link between housing and economic development is really even more obviously intertwined, right? And we're seeing more employers come to the table and say, this isn't working for us, what can we do to impact this? And I would say for me, that's something that's 
exciting, uh, you know, crisis and challenge breeds innovation and breeds new opportunities to find new ways of doing things. And I think we're starting to see that with, um, you know, in other communities, we're seeing, as you mentioned, school districts that are coming forward and saying, we need housing for our for our teachers. We're seeing municipalities who are saying, we need housing for our essential workers, including our um, police force and our first responders and these really essential services to communities, you know, small rural communities and larger places like Missoula. Um, so I think, you know, we've at NeighborWorks, we've looked for a long time at um, employer based solutions to housing. There are really great models all across the country where I, I guess an, another sector that I think is really core to this is the healthcare sector. We have a lot of people who work in in healthcare, and there's a huge range of income levels um, within those types of organizations. So we've seen, again, in other places where employers are creating down payment assistance programs, or they're working with developers to build housing that their workforce can afford. Um, so I think it will, you know, that's a an opportunity and something I know many of us are looking at. Where, you know, where are those links, and who are those employers who really want to be involved in this issue? Um, I think the other thing that's interesting about the current environment is in addition to that link between economic development and housing, we're seeing the link between housing and some other core issues. And the two that I would highlight are um, environmental concerns and social justice. Um, I read there was an article in the New York Times recently that said, if you care about social justice, you should be working on zoning and planning. Um, uh, just an interesting idea or, you know, an important and powerful concept to say that if if we care about equity, if we care about making sure that people can live in our community, there's there's this whole other layer to the conversation as well, which is where do we allow people to build homes and of what type in our community? And if we care about climate and the environment and we want those homes to be close to our downtown core and where we have services and infrastructure instead of having people driving to qualify, as you were noting, Amina, um, we should care about housing as well. So I, again, I think there's some really great opportunity to bring in new voices and new partners and new stakeholders to this work. So hopefully that's the up, one of the upsides of um, the current crisis we face. So let's let's talk now about what role individual donors can play in this work. This this work can feel so big and complicated and hard to understand and hard to hard to figure out how to make a meaningful impact. But um, we all know that individual donors can be really incredible um, advocates and stakeholders in this work. So Cindy, let's start with you. What role can individual donors have in this work? And what impact can these donors have on your organization and on housing solutions? Great. Well, I think, you know, donors uh, can provide financial support for services, programs, development across the continuum of need, um, you know, from emergency assistance for those who don't have homes or at risk of losing them uh, to organizations working to develop affordable housing um, to efforts to address individual barriers to housing stability um, and to policy advocacy to dismantle systemic issues um, that have created in Montana one of the most significant disparities between the average cost of housing and the average household income. So I think just looking at the continuum of uh, issues related to uh, housing and um, workforce. Great. Andrea, what role can individual donors have in this work? Well, I'm going to roll right off of this legislative large policy question um, and conversation here. Donors can be advocates and they can be powerful advocates when they are able to express um, how they want to be able to see where they put their money um, and in their investment into uh, larger public policy. And I, uh, Homeward, as well as, as uh, a number of organizations on this panel are members of the Montana Housing Coalition. And we advocated for several bills this session to increase the number of resources 
um, that we have here in the state of Montana to build and preserve homes that are affordable. And um, we did not see as much as we'd like to see go forward. However, donors can call the governor right now. We were able to get House Bill 397 passed through both houses of our legislature and it is sitting on the governor's desk. House Bill 397 is a bill that creates state workforce housing tax credits and those build more rental homes that Montana workers and seniors can afford. It also preserves existing properties that might be at uh, jeopardy of losing their affordability and going to market rate. So 24 other states in our country have passed a state housing credit. And if we had this important resource in Montana, it would be a very uh, important tool. We need more tools that are local and state generated in order to match the existing programs that we currently utilize, which are not enough, as we've mentioned throughout this entire panel. So again, that's House Bill 397 and call the governor today. It's sitting on his desk and we need to make sure that he understands how important this is to um, our local community. Donors can encourage their friends to do the same. Um, we uh, Donors can share about our work, um, telling folks about empowering renter, home buyer, and financial skill building programs. So, you know, like Homeward on Facebook, share that with your friends, encourage people to take the, the classes um, it's, it warms my heart so much. I run into folks randomly that have benefited from our financial skill building or home buying programs. And just uh, last week, I ended up um, on a bike ride with a friend of a friend and they were positioned to buy their home when the opportunity became available because they took both of our classes and they followed the guidance that our coaches gave them. And so they pay down debt, they improve their credit, they save for a down payment. And when the opportunity came to buy the rental that they live in, they bought it. And they just had a new baby. And it is just so exciting to see this new family be able to prosper here in Missoula. And they never thought they were going to be able to pull it off. And they did. So uh, donors can share the word. And, and importantly, donors can contribute to Homeward to help support the programs I just mentioned. We provide those um, for free or very little cost, our home buyer education class. There is a small fee to attend, but we really try to eliminate the barriers of uh, paying for those services in order to get more people to participate. And so um, individual donors are extremely helpful um, in that sense. And we have a Missoula Gives campaign. Um, so please go ahead and visit that. Um, Cindy, you brought up the landlord liaison landlord support um, earlier. And, and Homeward does have a landlord liaison position where we have a staff member that works with area landlords to help them um, find the support they need in the community to rent to people with barriers. And that might be folks that have an eviction or maybe um, have poor credit or have a, a were previously incarcerated, you know, things of that nature, you can imagine how difficult it is for um, folks that have additional barriers to actually get into a rental and keep it. Our landlord liaison is there to help support the landlord because landlords don't know all of the different resources and programs in the community. And what we're asking these landlords to do is take a chance, take a chance on these people, take a chance on families, and we will be here to help you navigate the situation if, um, if, if you need it, if you need the help. We have a risk mitigation program, which is basically like an insurance program, then for preferred partner landlords, folks that have been willing to reduce one or more barriers. So it might be just reducing your credit score or being willing to take a security deposit in installments. Those are a couple of examples of ways that really help people get into a rental home. And if folks are willing to do that, we will um, sign on and, and um, you could be eligible for this risk mitigation program, which is basically like an insurance program. If something does go sideways and um, there's a thousand dollars there to help pay for rent that doesn't get paid or damages, we don't ever want to use it. It's just like insurance, but it's there. And we actually have 12 local uh, landlords that have signed on as preferred partners. And that's an area that um, donors could support as well. Great. Lots Thank of you. great places to be engaged. 
Armina, how about you? What role can individual donors have in this work? So um, we also have a Missoula Gives campaign, obviously. Um, and I would love it if donors looked at that campaign today and donated. Um, we're focusing it this year on our acquisition fund that we're trying to build up so that we can pounce on properties and um, turn them into permanently affordable home ownership opportunities for people in, in Missoula. Um, we also um, have a way of, um, sorry, um, there's also always a way of taking on um, land donations and discounted properties. Um, and so I'd love for donors to spread the word to people who own property around Missoula that they can actually donate property to us and they can get a tax break. And we can talk to them about um, being part of our new program, uh, which is the Home Buyer Choice Program where we're helping people who are low income purchase homes on the regular market and turning them into permanently affordable homes. Um, so spread the word to um, people who own property if they are worried about workers moving out of town or people, neighbors work moving out of town and being displaced and they have a property that they think they could make available to a low income family, um, we can help make that happen and we have the, some subsidy to help um, purchase the homes. So yeah, and thanks for having me on the panel. Yeah, and Armina, I think with the land donation, my understanding is it doesn't have to be the full value of the land. You're also looking at ways to do partial donations as well. Absolutely, yeah. Discounted sales are a huge way for us to work with um, potential sellers on, on the market and get a tax break for them, so. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say in terms of, you know, big picture, the role that individual donors play is so critical to this work. Um, we do get a lot of federal support. I know a lot of and state and increasingly state support, thankfully, call the governor's office, ask for that state support today. Um, but but we do need those private dollars in order to, I think two really important things happen with private dollars. One is it allows us to leverage all of those other sources of funding and make projects work. We always have to have some of either our own funds or private dollars that go into building these multi-million dollar projects or that go into providing education and counseling. Um, that always has to be part of the puzzle. And then the other is that individual dollars allow us to innovate because a lot of the sources of funding we work with are very restrictive and very, there's a box that we have to fill. There's a program we have to deploy in a certain way. But when we have dollars from individual donors, we have a lot more flexibility to do things that we know are gonna work and that we, we know our needs and opportunities in the community, but there's not a government program that's set up to support that work. Um, and so I just, you know, again, this is a complex arena, but there are hopefully the takeaway is there are a lot of different ways to be involved. And we just really encourage you all to find the thing that you're most passionate about, the place that you feel most interested in being involved, whether that's, you know, with the YWCA or Homeward or Trust Montana or any of the other really fantastic organizations we have in our community. We are only four of the many, many groups working on housing. We haven't even talked about homelessness today and the incredible work happening there. So I'd love to close out the session by just popcorning and let's let's call out some of our other really incredible collaborators and peers in this space. So one that I would mention is um, the Missoula Housing Authority. Who else? Habitat Andrea for Humanity. Or Cindy, who are some of our Habitat? I'd say NMCDC. Forward Montana is doing some amazing work. Yep. Missoula Interfaith Collaborative. Pavarello Center. I there's a there's United a whole Gospel range Mission. Of them, I guess. <laughs> Gospel yeah. Mission. United, United Way. Way. Yeah. So please check out all those organizations. Oh my bright halo light just came on. Um and <laughs> as as uh, Andrea mentioned the Montana Housing Coalition is another great place to understand what's happening with these links between our local, our state, and our federal work. So thank you all so much. It's been really, 
great talking with you all today. You have just, you're all incredible leaders and doing fantastic work in Missoula. And um, all of you out there listening, we hope it's been informative and we can't wait to work with you. Marcy and Nikki. Thank you. I think we are good. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Kaya, thank you. Thanks, Kaya. Yeah.